So there have been evolutions in our techniques that have started with classic external fixation. And over the years, we have tried to decrease our time in X-Fix and, and uh, um, added um, internal fixation. And we call that integrated techniques. And then now we have the ability to do full uh, internal uh, bone transport. And essentially, you know, the idea uh, has been to, to decrease the amount of time uh, in the fixator from, you know, from a lot to you know, a limited time to no time in the fixator. But there are a lot of important details. And uh, as we know in life, everything comes at a cost. So traumatic bone defect is sort of, sort of a, a, a typical uh, case where I used classic technique. Here's my bone defect. And so I, this was a all uh, external fixation technique. Even this was a bit of an evolution because this is a, a stacked hexapod frame. And I, I do recall when I first started doing these, the, uh, the real uh, diehard uh, bone transport Elizarovians Il 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 uh, were critical of this. Um, but I would still call this classic external fixation technique because what we're doing is we're lengthening proximally and we're we're shortening uh, distally, and we're essentially uh, doing a bi what's called a bifocal technique. Uh, the lengthening and the shortening is done at the same time because in this case, the fibula is, uh, is intact. And the advantage of the hexapod here is that it really helps you with um, alignment and control, okay? So there was no acute shortening done here because the fibula was intact, and because of that, the lengthening and the shortening rates were at the same rate. It's well aligned and ultimately the patient had equal leg lengths and this was the clinical result. I think the hexapod frame really, really helped us um, get very pretty looking alignment x-rays at the end of this. Because with, uh, with, the, with, the, with the rod techniques, you would get some drifting and sometimes it was a little difficult to control some of the uh, positioning. So, this was this is what I would call classic technique. We we reported our experience uh, using this technique, and we found it to be very very effective. I mean, the only problem was that patients were in a fixator for a long period of time. Another example of what I would call classic technique, perhaps a little bit more complicated. This was a patient, uh, Joe. You'll know this was a this was actually a transfer from uh, your old place. Um, just as it got hit with Hurricane Sandy. This, this, this young man actually got airlifted from, uh, from Charity Hospital in Louisiana uh, um, when, when, when the city just got totally dilapidated and um, 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 these patients were sent anywhere and everywhere. But anyway, this, this patient was initially treated there and then ultimately came up here. And uh, this is what, how he presented to me uh, having had this terrible uh, injury that had many, many levels, including his knee and, and a large bone defect and a, loss, a large soft tissue defect. So essentially what we did is we reconstructed the knee in a, in a, uh, in a percutaneous fashion by trying to uh, restore the tibial plateau, large bone defect. So we did a bifocal lengthening. Essentially what I would call this is a trifocal technique because there are three levels um, there's shortening proximally, and then there's lengthening on two levels. But you can even really call it a, a four-level technique because there was instability of the knee, and you'll see that the knee was spanned with a hinged frame as well. But this is how this thing progresses with gradual lengthening uh, in two places. Ultimately, it, it docks into place, and uh, it takes quite a leap of faith to uh, believe that this is actually going to work. Um, but it does, and you can see that little by little, uh, the frame is complex, but it's doing what it needs to do. And ultimately, uh, we got a really nice reconstruction with um, filling in and, and union of the regenerate. And you can see that we were able to really stabilize his knee in a reasonable way, given what we started with. And uh, this is his end result. Okay, so now let me, let me show you another case, and this is an example of a bone defect in the foot ankle area. 
And this patient had an explantation of a failed uh, total ankle replacement. Now this is too big for acute shortening. And so the technique here is gonna be uh, some acute and gradual shortening, okay? So here you can see I've done that. I've done some acute shortening in the operating room. I've done the rest gradually, but now I need to make up for the bone defect. And I'm doing that at a proximal tibial level. Now, why is this an evolution in the technique? Well, two things are different. One is that the shortening and the lengthening are at different rates, okay? So that's one idea and one concept that's important is that if you can shorten more quickly and get that to close down more quickly, that's a positive thing. But the other thing is that we, we also uh, used integrated fixation here and we used Latin or lengthening and then nailing for the proximal part so that we could decrease the time in the external fixation. So here you can see we achieved union in both locations. And this strategy of limb salvage uh, and reconstruction of the ankle using uh, fusion and simultaneous lengthening has been, uh, has been very useful and has been reported. Next um, case example that I think represents another evolution is shown here. This is a patient who has a 17 centimeter bone defect and what we did is we treated with a with bone transport over a nail. So step one, you can see this is an infected non-union with uh, dead bone and uh, drainage. This looks like cement, but it's not. It's actually a necrotic segment of bone. This is the surgical approach, and this is the excision of the bone. It's all dead piece of bone. So step one was an insertion of an antibiotic coated nail and sterilization of the area and treatment of the infection. And stage two was then bone transport over a nail, insertion of an IM nail and a cable bone transport by pulling the segment over the nail. And you can see we used uh, pulleys and gradually we're pulling the bone down until we eventually get more and more regenerate and it's working its way down until it's docked in place. And then you can see it's stabilized by the intramedullary nail, along with some blocking screws, and ultimately the patient healed very, very nicely. Mitch Bernstein did a, uh, an animation of this that has like a gazillion views on, on YouTube, so I would encourage you to check it out. But this is an example of integrated fixation, and we were able to demonstrate that this is very safe and effective, and bottom line is it has two principal advantages. Number one, it gets people out of the fixator more quickly, and number two, um, it um, decreases the risk of refracture. Here's another case example that I think represents another evolution in our approach and in our technique. This is a patient who had a um, um, talus ankle trauma and uh, was treated with this um, talus implant done by another surgeon about a decade earlier, and it did well for a number of years, but ultimately uh, the patient developed pain and arthritis and required a, a different solution. So my strategy here was going to be to remove this implant and do a, um, again, an ankle fusion with a proximal tibial lengthening. So how did I do that? Here, I used the fixator for the distal part, but now for the proximal tibial lengthening, rather than extending my frame, um, I decided to use a fully internal uh, lengthening nail. Also, again, representing a bifocal integrated technique, if you will. So we used the frame for what I thought was the optimal solution for the ankle, but I used the internal lengthening nail as an easier, more simple solution for the patient uh, proximally. And you can see we were able to achieve nice union uh, in both locations. Patient um, uh, is shown here uh, with the final result with equal leg lengths and really, really did quite well. And further advances in the world of bone transport have come with some of these, um, we'll call them fully internal solutions, but integrated techniques, okay? So there is the uh, plate assisted bone transport and then ultimately, the, uh, the ultimate transition, which we've all been hoping for, which is a fully uh, internal lengthening nail. And so 
the idea um, is been, has been thought about and has been fantasized for many, many years, but then ultimately Nuvasiv came up with a very, very nice solution and it is available, although it has some limitations. So the bone transport nail is a takeoff on the internal lengthening nail and it is a, it's a mechanical device that allows um, bone transport without the need for external fixation completely. So here's an example of a case that I did. This is a patient who has a bone defect, post-traumatic, and you can see the planning that goes into figuring out the nail size, et cetera. And so stage one in this situation, I wasn't convinced that this was fully um, sterile. So stage one was a debridement, excision of, um, of the necrotic segment, and insertion of an antibiotic coated nail and sterilization of that area. And then once I was confident about that, I went back and I did my bone transport nail, did the osteotomy, and I'll sort of take you through a little bit of the timeline so you can appreciate some of the stages of this. You can see the proximal tibial osteotomy uh, and the bone defect in place. Um, that is the um, screw that is in the transport segment that is going to be pulling the transport segment down. That's the osteotomy. I added some blocking screws because I wanted to make sure that there wasn't gonna be any deviation of the segment. This is what the uh, bone transport nail looks like. Uh, we used the longest particular nail in this, in this individual because he's a really tall guy. The experience for the patient is much easier, no doubt about it. Fixators are fantastic, but if you can treat a patient effectively without a fixator, it's easier for the patient. Um, we started off at, uh, at a pretty slow rate. You can see the nail is doing exactly what it is supposed to be doing with gradual progression. You can see it working its way down. Uh, the defect is getting smaller. At this point, I decided to take the patient back to the operating room for bone grafting of the defect through a small minimal incision. At the same time, I added bone marrow concentrate to the regenerate, which you can see on the other slide. And this is what it looks like at docking. Pretty optimistic uh, at this point uh, with the, uh, the healing progressing. And then we are just sort of following this thing at this point. And you can see uh, June, July, Unfortunately, the progress was a little bit on the slow side, and uh, the regenerate wasn't kind of coming along as much as quickly as I would have liked. And I think at some point we all have to make a decision about whether you sort of just keep watching or if you do something active. And we decided that uh, it was important to do something because ultimately the nail was going to fail and we weren't making progress. So we took the patient to the operating room to do an exchange nailing. Now, I didn't want to lose any of my positions, so I put a temporary external fixator on the patient. Um, unfortunately, uh, at the time of the exchange nailing, we did find that there was a P. acne's positive culture. Um, and so we had to deal with that. And of course, we just treated this. But the, the idea of this technique was to place a temporary external fixator the, these wires are uh, placed in such a way that it doesn't get in the way of my uh, path of my nail so that I can do what I need to do in terms of doing the exchange nailing. So those wires are, are posterior to the nail and so they're not in the way of the nail. And this is what you can see. This is what it looks like after the, uh, the, um, the exchange nailing. In place, I used a, a much larger uh, diameter nail at this point, so I was able to get some good stability. And what I did is I drilled a hole in my striker nail so that I, I could put in a screw so that I wouldn't get bounce back of the uh, transport uh, segment. And so these are just some uh, technical, technical points that go along with this. Drilling the nail, drilling the hole in the nail is a pretty easy thing to do with a carbide drill. And then you can insert your nail while the fixator is on so you don't lose any position. And then this technique seems to be working nicely because we're getting more and more calcification uh, of the regenerate and healing. So the patient's doing well, putting full weight bearing at this point. And I do think that 
we're, we will be able to have achieved successful bone transport without an external fixator. So in summary, there has been an evolution in our technique. We've gone from classic to integrated uh, to fully internal. I don't think that um, um, there's one technique for all. I think we have to have all of these te techniques in our armamentarium to make sure that we can um, treat every patient optimally. But, de but essentially what this has done is it's decreased and minimize the time needed in external fixation and, and uh, also decrease the rate of refracture. So there clearly are advantages in decreasing the, the use of the external fixator if we can, we can do that. But remember that the, the external fixator is the most versatile of the techniques and the internal fixation is the least versatile of the techniques. And I think that might be a good way of thinking about it. So there are lots of, of, of issues, including defect size, the presence or absence of a growth plate, uh, defect management plus lengthening, et cetera, that goes into making decisions about which of these techniques we're going to use. I do think that in my, in, 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 in my uh, career over the next number of years, that even though we'll be using more and more of the internal lengthening technique, I don't think that we'll ever stop using the other two techniques, and we have to be prepared for that. So in summary, remember, examine your patient carefully and consider all the different options. Plan your surgeries carefully. Make sure that you're prepared for intraoperative decision-making. And be fully engaged with your patients after surgery. And if you do all of these things, you'll be famous and your patients will love you.